So uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for for creating uh, 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 the opportunity to meet uh, uh, so many interesting people and uh, many many old friends and uh, uh, the opportunity to, to to make new friends. So this is great. So this is uh, I think is one, uh, one of the best conferences, uh, one of the best workshops I've ever been. So it's a it's a, it's a pleasure. So today I'm going to be talking about some uh, plausible and some um, plausible mechanisms for uh, cortical uh, variability. I'm going to go through uh, some uh, introduction. Uh, it's going to be a little bit maybe repetitive, uh, but uh, it's, it's going to serve to focus uh, really very well what uh, what is the topic of uh, the particular topic. Of this, uh, of this uh, presentation. So as you well know, in the peripheral nervous system, uh, neural responses are very reliable. If I touch uh, the skin of your hand with some pressure, both the number of spikes and, and the timing of the spikes is going to be very reproducible from time to time. The story in cortex is, uh, is quite different. So uh, I'm going to, uh, so neural in uh, some of its cortex uh, like uh, responding to this kind of stimulus. So this is a drifting uh, a grating and uh, moving in a particular in the receptive field of a, of, a, of a neuron. If you present this stimulus, you are going to get a response uh, like this. So this is a sequence of spikes over time uh, that tend to be uh, grouped in, uh, in bars of spikes. The surprise arises when you repeat exactly the same experiment in the same monkey, the same neuron, using exactly the same stimulus, you get a pretty much a completely different response. And if you keep repeating again and again this stimulus, you get a sequence of unique uh, responses. And only when you start to see all these uh, responses, all these trials uh, at the same time, you start to appreciate that uh, this neuron uh, uh, like to uh, fire at a particular phase of the periodic movement of this, uh, of this uh, gradient. So you, you know very well all this. But this, this actually looks like, like, a, like a very bad design for a system which is uh, supposed to, to, trans to transmit and maybe transform the information to higher order uh, uh, areas. Uh, indeed, if you were about to, to, to buy a computer and you go to, to your pref uh, preferred shop, and uh, while the, uh, the vendor is, is describing the characteristics of this computer, is telling you that each time that you press a key of this computer, you're going to get a completely different response, probably you won't buy this computer. Yet, this is the region where the, where the brain is, 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 uh, seems to be working, in this uh, region of high variability. So, so here is going to be this, uh, uh, using the classical description by Schaller and Newton that have been presented before by uh, Bert in the first day. So I'm uh, taking it uh, again. And I'm going to, uh, uh, if you have further questions, I mean, you can ask, uh, you can ask uh, Mike. But essentially here, uh, they recorded the Nino in, uh, in MT, individual, uh, individual neurons. And this is the, the spike trends that they got across many cells as a function of time for a same neuron under the, the analytical stimulus repeated again and again. And here you have the very stimulus time history, essentially showing the, the firing rate of the time of this neuron. Essentially, they focus on, on, on time windows where the firing rate was pretty much constant, like, uh, like this one. And from those time windows, they start to compute the statistical properties of these, uh, of these uh, spike trends. So they, fed, they computed the inter spike interval, and they found that this uh, close to exponential. It's not exponential, but uh, you can call this Poisson uh, uh, exponential distribution. But the interesting feature is that uh, you plot the variance of the spike count as a function of the mean of the spike count. This uh, pretty much follows a linear uh, uh, dependent. I mean, there is some departures, but uh, we are not going to make a big story about these small departures uh, relative to the, to the straight line. So in summary, the fan of factor, which is the ratio between the, the variance of the spike count and the mean of the spike count, is constant, but crucially, is constant over a very broad range of firing rates that typically encompass like, uh, several orders of magnitude, from a few uh, hertz to uh, a few, uh, very few uh, hundreds of hertz. This property that has been observed uh, before these authors and after these authors by many other uh, groups has been called Poisson like uh, fire. So all this looks like a very uh, detailed description of, uh, of uh, spiking variability. And you can wonder, actually, you, I don't think that you are going to wonder why it's important to, to understand variability. But, but uh, for, for the naive, for the naive uh, 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 listener, what you should 
about this, uh, this precise characterization of the statistical properties of, of spikes. Well, uh, variability, the, the type of variability that you, you see in cortex uh, impose uh, crucial constraints as to how much information you can get uh, from sensory uh, stimuli. Some types of variability might be uh, very appropriate for some type of computations, like they can inference. Variability may, may be a result of, of, uh, of, uh, of some computational properties of uh, like a sampling a process of internal states. Moreover, spiking variability can represent hidden relevant variables, such as tension or other, inter other internal variables. So therefore, understanding the statistical properties of, of, of spike trends can tell you a lot about the statistical properties of these uh, hidden variables. And the focus of today's uh, talk is that actually the nature and the mechanistic origin of this type of variability, of poisson vari uh, like variability is unknown, despite of probably what you believe that this, this is a solved problem. So, so here I'm going to be showing to you the, the simulation results using a, a, a quite a typical uh, recurrent network, uh, which uh, follows some of the principles uh, described by the famous paper by Van Breschke and Son Poliski of uh, balanced uh, chaotic uh, networks. So essentially we have a recurrent network consisting of both excitatory and inhibitory neurons connected reciprocally. And in addition, there are external inputs that essentially control the firing rate of these of these uh, two poles. And so far, we're going to assume that there, are, there is no noise in the inputs. Okay, so this is going to be a, a, a recurrent network in this, uh, in this uh, in traditional setup. Not surprisingly, both the excitatory and inhibitory currents are very strong, and they cancel each other in such a way that the, the, the total drive is linear in around threshold, which uh, causes that the irregular firing at the, at the spike, uh, at the spike uh, time level of the, of the two populations. Now, what you can do is to stimulate this, uh, this network. This is, this is uh, this will be the, the, the response of this network. This is the firing rate as a function of the input drive. And for this kind of bad networks, uh, we know that this, uh, this uh, dependence is linear. So this is, uh, this is uh, consistent with all what we know about uh, chaotic uh, balance uh, networks. But now, what you can do is to is plot the final factor as a function of the firing rate of this network. And uh, not surprisingly, for uh, small fire rates, uh, who start has been showing uh, results uh, on these lines and, and so the speakers too, that for small rates, you get that the final factor is close to one. So this, uh, this is great. So it looks consistent with Poisson like uh, variability. But the problem, you already saw that, is that as you increase the fire rate of this neuron, the final factor drops dram dramatically as a function of the fire rate. So essentially, as soon as uh, you have uh, rates above uh, 20, 30, 50 hertz, it depends on the parameters of the network, the final factor is going to drop dramatically. Yes. This is current based. But the similar results happen for a constant based network. And uh, so this is not a particular uh, 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 condition for this set of values of parameters that I've chosen. You can show uh, mathematically for uh, current based networks that this is going to be a general scenario for at, at high rate. So, so this causes a problem uh, because experimentally we know that the Poisson variability uh, happens to hold for very broad ranges of fire rate. So what this means is that uh, the chaotic dynamics that uh, this model was able to generate is uh, what too deterministic. So, so having chaotic dynamics doesn't mean that you have some like variability. You can have different types of, uh, uh, of variability. And this kind of networks uh, doesn't lead to Poisson like variability. So what this is telling us immediately is that we need some additional source of variability. Okay. So, so this is the additional source of variability that was introduced by Archner et al. So they take this same network, and they stimulate the network with Poisson-like inputs. Okay. And for some parameters of the network, for essentially connectivity and strength between neurons, they found that the spike count varies as proportional to the spike count mean, like these, uh, these aspects are there. But if you move away from this optimal value, you could have either a, a sub Poisson or super Poisson uh, uh, firing, where actually the final factor changes very dramatically with, uh, with the firing rates. Okay, so this solution is, uh, is a little bit unsatisfactory in the sense that, uh, that uh, this network is creating Poisson-like variability 
just because you have put put Poisson like variability in the input. And it's not clear and it leaves completely and elsewhere the question of, of where and how this Poisson variability has been or originated uh, from in the first place. Moreover, this uh, Poisson like uh, input uh, assumption fails to fails to, to find experimental support. So this is a very recent uh, paper by a uh, first at, uh, first at uh, group where they uh, computed the fun factor of, you know, of LDN uh, neurons as a function of the contrast, and you see a very big reduction of the final factor. So this is very far from being constant final factor as a function of contrast. And because contrast is uh, related to the final rate, what this means, what this means is that the final factor changes very strongly with the, with the rates of, this, uh, of these neurons. So essentially, we cannot count Although we can count on some input variability, we cannot count on the, on the truly Poisson-like variability in the input. So let me uh, summarize and, uh, and review a little bit the status quo of the, of the, of, uh, of the field. So we, see, we have seen that the chaos imbalance towards doesn't, that's not necessarily to poisson -like variability unless inputs are themselves uh, Poisson-like variability, so this is a solution or network parameters are fine-tuned in such a way that the network is working in a very broad range of, uh, of input parameters in the so-called noise-driven uh, uh, noise regime. So this is a work that we did uh, with uh, Alfonso, uh, uh, Nestor, and Xiaojin, where essentially you can show that uh, for very big networks, there is essentially very few points where, where this will uh, hold true. So essentially you will need fine-tuning. So uh, if there is a mechanism that uh, creates this fine-tuning, you could get question like variability with this kind of that one. This one? Yeah. Well, because it, because the thalamic neurons, they don't have that. They don't have that property. Yeah, of course. Yeah, but I, I mean, take this, uh, these two puts like the whole, uh, the whole network. So there has to be something that is created somewhere. So. So we know that from uh, 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 old papers uh, by uh, Mayne and other authors that uh, you cannot uh, use, uh, <laughs> not very old. I mean, <laughs> you were very young when you, you published this probably. <laughs> All for me, but. Uh, so, so you cannot, you cannot use uh, uh, neurons. I mean, uh, the point of this is that uh, you cannot come off LMP neurons. So this is the, the, all the criticism that I always make. So, to, to, to Alex, that uh, I mean, neurons, neurons are uh, reliable by, by themselves. So we have seen uh, here in the, uh, along the, the, the workshop, very, very interesting discussions about the learning uh, by SAC, uh, variable internal states, uh, uh, Gustavo and the other people are talking about EEG and, uh, and uh, other fMRI studies, and so optimal inference, uh, 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 Alex, so this whole thing amplify noise for sure, but they don't generate the noise. They don't generate the variability. So we, we still have a problem as to where these variabilities are originated from. This person like variabilities are originated from. And uh, one uh, one player that has been ignored so far is the uh, the stochastic neurotransmitter release in cortex. Okay, so this is this is a very well known fact. That synapses are very unreliable. In some, in, in, in many contexts, unreliable. And this is a, a true source of noise that you have in cortex. Typically, it's, uh, it's ignored at the, 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 the computational neuroscience level. We don't, uh, we don't typically uh, uh, pay too much attention to this, uh, to this uh, topic. And of course, if you take this, uh, one, uh, one of these networks and you add this type of, uh, of noise, you're going to introduce some variability. But the relevant questions here are whether this variability is going to be high enough, and secondly, that this variability is going to be Poisson-like. So these are the, 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 the questions that I would like to address uh, here briefly. So here I took the, the previous uh, neural network, and the only thing they did is to, to replace the, the, the perfect signals that they have in the network by, uh, by uh, synapses that are essentially subject to failure. So here we have a presynaptic neuron projected to a collection of presynaptic neurons through a, a, a synaptic contacts. The neuron fire sequence of spikes pass through the synaptic contacts, 
and create a sequence of postsynaptic currents that essentially are diluted versions of the input spike trend. And these, uh, these uh, postsynaptic currents are independent. The, 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 the probability of moving spikes is independent across, uh, across the spikes and across contacts. As soon as you introduce this ingredient in your neural network, what you find, so the fine tuning of the parameter, is that the final factor remains high for a very broad range of firing rates, comparing uh, two orders of magnitude of firing rate without any fine tuning. If you remove this property for that network and you compensate for changes of firing rate by uh, adjusting other parameters, what you see is that the final factor drops dramatically, as we saw before, in the absence of this uh, probability synaptic uh, transmission. So uh, how did this work? So this is actually an uh, interesting uh, uh, mechanism. So here we have the open loop uh, network, where essentially we have, we assume that the presynaptic neuron receive a, a collection of input spike trains characterized by some input variants, generate a spike train characterized by uh, this intermediate variance, and finally, through the synaptic contacts that are stochastic, it generates a sequence of presynaptic currents characterized by this output variance. So in the, in the open uh, network, these two numbers doesn't need to be the same, but of course, when we connect the network, we, when we close the network, this uh, variant has to be equal to the input variant, okay? So, so here what I'm plotting is the output variance as a function of the input variance. And in the dashed line, what we uh, are plotting here is the variance of this intermediate uh, spectrum as a function of the input variance. And uh, this, uh, this, uh, so these are uh, results for a perfect integral of fire neuron. So if you have uh, leaky, uh, leak, uh, leakiness, you will have some small departures from this, but this is the very general picture that should apply for very, very general uh, type of, uh, of networks. So, so this is what you get. Uh, essentially, this line is a, a, a slope uh, smaller than one, and this is for stability reasons. So the output variability, essentially, the network, the, the neuron has to work in the kind of an integrator state, uh, where essentially it's adding up uh, spikes and reducing that variance. So this is the dash line. The important thing is to see what's happening with this, uh, with this uh, when this spike train passes through the synapses. What this uh, step is, in, is doing is actually introducing noise equally for all input variances in such a way that this line is going to be shifted vertically. And now you're going to have intersection point which is going to correspond to a steady state, a, a plausible steady state condition in the, in the network, where the input variance equals the output variance. The critical uh, step now is to understand how this uh, shift depends with the firing rate. And you can see that the, the, the firing rate actually shifts uh, proportionally, the, the, the shift is proportional to the changes in firing rate in such a way that these intersection points, when plotted as a function of firing rate, make a straight line. And as a consequence, for, almost for free, you're going to have final factor uh, constancy for very broad ranges of firing rate, subject to small departures depending on, the, on, on some features of the, of, the, of the model. But this is going to be the general, the, the general scenario. So uh, to summarize this, uh, this, uh, this uh, mechanism, so I have this, uh, this uh, scheme where essentially we have identified two uh, major players here in, the, in controlling the variance of this, uh, this, this type of networks. One is the neural integration step, which tends to lower variability. And the second is a probabilistic synapsis uh, step, which tends to uh, increase the variability. So these two tendencies cancel out uh, precisely in this uh, self-consistent uh, loop in such a way that the resulting variance is proportional to the firing rate of these, uh, of these spike trends. So now you can ask, uh, Ruben, this is very interesting, but uh, you, you are throwing noise in, in, into the brain. I mean, you are like, uh, I mean, you are, are you saying that uh, this noise needs to be amplified? Uh, and uh, here, here, Alice can come to the rescue and could say, well, this is independent noise across contacts, so it's, it's very likely, uh, it's, not, it's very, uh, uh, very likely it's not going to affect at all your decoding performances. And this is completely true. So this noise, even if it's amplified, is independent across contacts, 
and uh, we don't have the, 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 the algorithm to, to undo this, uh, this uh, amplification, but a priori you could undo it. And if you have a big network, you could recover, recover perfectly all the information. But uh, there's a second, uh, a second uh, question. is uh, well, does it, have, does it have some function? Uh, maybe yes, maybe this has some function. And here, uh, to, to, to illustrate this uh, potential function of amplifying uh, noise and creating Poisson-like variability, I'm going to use an example of one of my uh, preferred habits, which is, uh, for example, by stability. So, so this is uh, the infamous uh, 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 phases based uh, Rubin's uh, stimulus. It's ambiguous as to as to whether this is uh, uh, two phases or, or one phase. And one thing that I could do now is ask you to report the perceptual states of, uh, of uh, what you are perceiving from uh, across time while you are uh, watching this symbol. And what I could do is to compute the histogram or the fraction of time that each of you were perceiving the, the phase versus the phases. And let's assume that in this scenario, in this particular example, you perceive the phase by 70% uh, of, of the time. Okay, and now what I can do is lower the contrast of this uh, of this image. So here, a priori, a priori has not changed any uh, any uh, high level feature of this image. So if if uh, if uh, if uh, Ralph will tell uh, will tell me, well, here the brain is doing some sampling. So he's doing some sampling and probably is, is extracting uh, states. And uh, so this is something good to do. So it's something they agree to, to, to do. But uh, the question is whether the sampling properties should depend or not on contrast. And actually, one, one interesting property would be like a, it doesn't depend on contrast. Because essentially, you have not changed information as to whether this is a phase or, or, or phases or a base. You just have lowered the contrast. So yeah, if I ask you again to report your perceptual states, probably you will get exactly the same result. And if you look at the contrast, furthermore, you will get, uh, as long as it's above contrast, uh, detection threshold, of course, here is below, very likely. And uh, so contrast invariance uh, something will be a very uh, uh, desirable, a very uh, uh, interesting property to have in, uh, in, this kind of, uh, in this kind of networks. Actually, there are experimental uh, data in, in uh, in, uh, in binocular rivalry and, uh, and in this kind of literature, indicating that this is the case, that the, that the dynamics of, of, of sampling or foraging this state is relatively independent of the contrast. So now here I'm going to go through uh, 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 implementation of a network that is able to do something similar on those lines, and I'm going to uh, show you what is the effect of uh, probability synapses in this kind of networks or other types of, uh, of noise. So here we're going to have a uh, network. Essentially, it's going to try to, uh, well, this is the stimulus of the network. But actually, you can see the, 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 the red bars that will be like uh, orthogonal to the green bars. So, so this is going to be difficult to explain without seeing the stimulus. But anyways, so, so we build a neural network that essentially is going to try to decompose your input stimulus that is a linear combination of, of, uh, of patterns into a set of store patterns. And here you have the, the, the two patterns that correspond to the, to, the, to, the, to the combination that was uh, used to create the stimulus. And in green, you have a different pattern that this network is storing. Okay? And uh, we can see that the, the behavior of this network, which is going to be highly competitive, and is actually very closely related to the networks that uh, Sophie and uh, Christian has been uh, talking about. You can see that the behavior of this network as a function of time in these uh, in these rasters, and we can focus on the on the on the fire rate or the spikes of the neurons that corresponds to the to the to the constituent uh, patterns of this uh, stimulus. And uh, you can see that the fire rate of these two neurons uh, stand up. So essentially, this network is able to detect that these two patterns were participating in the, in the stimulus. And uh, the interesting property now is to is to ask what is the the the, the, the properties of this uh, of the of the crossings of these two lines that corresponds to the fire rates, the average fire rates of these two uh, of these two neurons, the red and the green neurons. 
And we can create a very simple model saying, well, your perception, your perceptual state is going to be uh, green when the activity of the green neuron is, is, uh, is, uh, is above red and the other way around. Another question is to know what is going to happen when, the, when you increase the contrast by twofold and you study the dynamics of this, uh, of this cosine. So here what you have is the, the fraction of dominance that the, the green line was above the, the red line. When you have the network of, uh, with probability synapses that essentially creates this Poisson-like variability, so these kind of networks are able to have this contrast invariant property very uh, automatically. So you don't need to do anything to sample neural states in a way that is, doesn't depend on contrast. But if you, uh, you have this network with constant noise, this uh, contrast invariant property disappears. It's completely destroyed. So just the, just the conclusion slide. So we have seen that the chaotic dynamics can be too deterministic to explain the Poisson-like variability that we see in cortex. We have a very interesting uh, uh, candidate to account for this uh, Poisson-like variability that actually leads to this kind of uh, structure without any, uh, any fine tuning of the parameters. We have seen that this type of variability can have important consequences, important uh, functions in, uh, in uh, multi-attractor uh, states uh, by supporting contrast disvariance uh, property. So thank you very much. Well, with the stimulus, this is what is going to happen. So when the stimulus uh, is uh, increasing the stimulus, uh, on average, all the new, uh, I mean, more and more neurons are going to be in, in the suprasensory region. Yeah, in general, there's going to be some neurons. The mean pattern is heterogeneous. Some neurons are in the suprasensory region. I, I don't understand how the, the mechanism the rescues that because since the variability is independent, it should be average. So you're talking about the this second scenario with the probability yeah. synapses. Okay. Now when you when you add the synapses, yeah. Adding noise to each of those inputs, uh, but their independence of the neuron is pulling across them. They're going to give you tiny. If you have a lot no, but this is amplified by recurrent uh, recurrent connectivity. So you are creating correlations too. So these these fluctuations are highly uh, highly amplified. The simulations that I showed to you was uh, was full co fully connected actually ah, okay. was fully connected, but this uh, this result is, is completely general. So it's dense and it's fully connected network. No, no, no. You can you can have uh, uh, stochastic release just in a one type of uh, receptors, yeah. uh, excitatory, for instance, and it will work in the same way. So that noise is going to be is going to be passing through all the all the network. So essentially, uh, finally, it's going to uh, hit uh, inhibitory neurons and. Uh, Yeah, the, so you're, you're talking about the, the rate dependence of yes. the of the synaptic release. Yeah, well, the, that's that's kind of a debate of how that. Uh, uh, I mean, in, in vitro recordings, there is a lot of. Uh, uh, I mean, many results show there they, they saturate, but they saturate at very high, a very low uh, firing rates. So this is what you're talking about, no? The the, the rate dependence of of the, the of the of the stochastic release of synapses. Okay, so let's <laughs> so let's talk. About when 
the heavens? Okay, yeah, no, the, Okay, yeah, well, that, that's connected to the regularity, uh, regularity of the network as you increase the, the input drive. But you overcome, you overcome that problem when you have uh, this type of variability. And, uh, you never encounter that uh, bifurcation. <laughs>